Hey everybody, it's Craig Syracuse. Welcome to a new episode of Walk in Faith. Yes, we are in the Opera House, but today's exciting. I'm sitting down with my friend, Judge Patricia Demango, and it's exciting because Monsignor Jamie doesn't like to share his contacts, but I was able to coordinate this interview. I want to thank you so much. Thank well, you. I am thrilled to be here, and I'm thrilled that the Monsignor actually gave up my number to you. <laughs> it, it took a while, <laughs> but the reason why we're here is because, I mean, everyone knows her from the hit show Hot Bench, which is number two, right? Number two judge show in the country. Judge Judy is still number one. Amazing. Well, the reason why we're sitting here is because you have this new book, and, and I don't know how you find the time. It's From the Kitchen to the Courtroom. And it really took me back to when I grew up in Bensonhurst, and you also grew up in Bensonhurst slash Dyka, and it was very different back then. But if you could tell us a little bit about what it was like growing up in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, or Dyka. As you know, it's a very tight, warm, ethnically homogeneous community, basically. We all centered around going to our churches, going back home, and eating and sharing dinner with the families. And Sunday was the most important day to us because it was on Sunday that we all gathered at my grandmother's home, all my first cousins, and there were 13 of us, wow. my aunts and uncles, and my parents, of course, my grandparents, and we would go right after Mass. Everyone would meet there. We'd go to our respective parishes, go there, and have andi pasta <laughs> and have homemade wine and all the things, the focaccia and all that my grandmother made herself. And we spent time with one another. And then we'd all go home and eat our Italian dinners. Wow. And I, I remember Monsignor Jamie told a story too, which you have in your book, very similar, how your grandmother would make the pasta and then put it on the <sighs> bed and then go to church and they'd come back. How important was, especially Sunday meals to your grandma, Josephine? I think that she worked the whole week for Sunday meal, you know, because that was when all of her children and all of her grandchildren could be under one roof. But you know what you're saying about putting the pasta on the sheet on the bed? I thought we were the only family that did that. But as you tell stories to people, you realize everything that they did must have been something they did in Italy. They came here from Italy. My mother was born in Italy. Her brothers and sisters were. So all of these traditions they brought here from their country. And when you talk to other people, I'm talking to you now, we did the same thing. We all did the same thing. It was amazing. They taught you love of family, mm -hmm. love of food, and of course, as the Monsignor would say, food, faith, and love. Yeah. You know, food, faith, and family. And, and, and that's really what you learned. And, you, and things are different today because I remember the first time a family member moved outside this two block radius where we all lived. Like my grandmother was the hub. She lived here with my grandfather, and we, her, her children kind of lived a block or so mm -hmm. away. But I remember when my Uncle Frank moved from here to here. Oh, my God. Oh, it was like he was ostracizing the family. <laughs> he was just like, what are, what are they doing? Why'd they go five blocks away? That's amazing. I, Grandma can't walk there. It's too far. But when I was a kid, I, I used to like to make salad. That was my thing, to cut and eat the olives. At what age were you introduced to cooking and what was your sort of job within the kitchen? Well, you know what? The book, From the Kitchen to the Courtroom, when we were growing up, you know, my father had been in school and so we lived. My grandmother had um, a four-room apartment, two bedrooms, a big kitchen area and a, and a living room. And my mother, my father and myself, when I was an infant, we would grew, I grew up in that room. The, until I was three years old, and my sister was you know, kind of born a little bit before that, and we couldn't stay there anymore. Mm -hmm. But I was, my high chair was in that kitchen. You know, that's where it was. There was nowhere else to be. So she would make the dough for the pasta or for the pizza, whatever, and they would put it on the high chair. That was how wow. I grew up, seeing my mother, my grandmother, my aunts cooking. So the kids had Play-Doh, I had pasta dough. What life lessons did you learn from being in the kitchen that you still use today for in the kitchen, but also within the courtroom? You learn to understand people. You learn to watch people, to read them, to read their expressions. You learn about getting along with one another. You learn that just because you're angry doesn't mean that you're not going to speak in 10 minutes. You learn about loving and connecting. And, and that's what we did. And we learn. And the thing is, at, when you're with, and, and, and you know, for those people who have children and all, if you're sitting at a dinner table with your kids, you know. You know if they're hanging out with bad people, you know if they're not eating, maybe something is wrong, maybe they don't feel well, maybe they're involved in drugs, maybe they're lovesick. You know, you learn a lot about sitting at a, at a kitchen table or mm -hmm. a dining room table 
with people. And you have conversations with people in a depth and with a warmth uh, that you would never have in just an, uh, any other social gathering. And then, of course, for my job, you know, that's how I learn. I, I look at people, I study people, uh, because I have to make snap decisions about what they're about. Interesting. You're right. Because even as a kid, you learn your place in the family. You learn to listen. Because you would sit at the kids' table, and then over time, when you matured, you would move on to the, the larger table. It's a commercial that I just saw for the first time a couple of nights ago. It's a family eating dinner, and then there's a kid's table, and the older boy is like now a little bit out of mm -hmm. place at the table, and his father goes like this with his I head. Saw that. You saw that, right? And, and he goes, like come initiation. and take your t and yep. take your place at the at the adult table. Yeah, you're and right. That's one knew. thing I constantly remind myself. Even when I go to meetings, know your place. Yeah. And, you know, it's in the Gospels, and it's like know your place, like. Don't try to outshine or don't try to move ahead. Like you just know your place. And as a kid, I remember my place. And then sooner or later, I was able to do certain things within the kitchen where I had more responsibility. And, and what's interesting in the book is the era. Like your grandmother, she taught you how to cook. She taught you how to make wine with Uncle Dominic. And you learn that, how to make a home. But at the same time, she instilled school. Like go to school, go to college, which wasn't... I, don't, I want to say, wasn't that popular it was back not. then? You, know, you can say it, because yeah. the reality was not every home, especially for immigrant Italian families, just like any other immigrant family that comes here, they're just trying to keep their head above water. You know, my grandparents were working, you know, not taking from anyone, just working hard to kind of put food on the table. If you had food on the table, you were rich, mm -hmm. right? You were rich. You knew it. Everybody was there. There was Nobody was hungry. So you kind of you learn that that's what it was all about. So what was your motivation? I know your, your dad was a, a dentist, right? My or father, father as he would say he was an oral surgeon. Oral surgeon. Yeah, I, it was I know, a big sorry. Thing. And it, your mother made a mark, I mean, in, in, in the community and history. You also made history, but what was the motivation? Because like you said, your, maybe your family and friends, it wasn't popular at the time. So what did you lean on? What was your motivation to continue? Well, we knew we had to go to college. And like you were saying earlier, education trumped anything. You know, we had to learn the basics, cooking, sewing, knitting, and all of that. I mean, I believe me, I wouldn't make you a, a sweater, take, take my word for it. <laughs> but, you know, I could cook you a meal. But, uh, but even though I learned those things, uh, education was, was stressed. Education was the only way that we really knew that we were going to move up and mm. move forward in life. And my, you know, my grandmother, for whatever her language barriers were and all, she knew that that, and she pushed my mother. And my mother went to, my mother went to college. My father, as you said, was, was a professional. And my mother, once she married, she put the education aside, as a lot of women do. And she became involved in in the community. Mm. She became involved in the school system. She was the local school board. She wow. was there from, from the inception. And she did this throughout her career. She took an interest in immigrant women. She put forward their cause to move into society, to get jobs, to have childcare so that they could do it. So she really, she was an icon within the Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, Bensonhurst, Dyker Heights community. Everyone recognizes that the ticket out of anywhere, mm -hmm. the ticket up and out is education. Okay. And we was, it was stressed in our lives. It's the church stresses it still. It's extremely important. And you spoke beautifully at, I think it was a recent function about the, you know, Catholic education, the importance of it. And you did make history. I mean, you were on Monsignor Jamie's show, but you spoke about just the, how many, you know, episodes you shoot in the schedule and you wrote the book but now, out of all the episodes you've done, is there something that you, one of the cases that you still think about, reflect on, that you still uh, sort of, you think about today? You know, there's more than one case that you think about. And generally, those are cases where and someone is taking advantage of or hurting someone who's vulnerable. Mm. I always feel like, you know, I want to be there for the underdog. Um, it's, it's different, you know, you go and you hire a contractor to paint your bathroom, he paints the floor. Instead of the bathroom, you sue him, you get your money back, kind mm -hmm. of. There's nothing personal, there's nothing painful in that. But when I get a case where there's pain, when someone's in pain and someone is abusing that and taking advantage oh. of that pain to their, that angers me more than anything. But I try to let them go, those yeah. cases. I try to let it go. But how do you disconnect from that? Is cooking a way of disconnecting, you go home and you make pasta? Is that what you do to disconnect? It's interesting because a lot of women don't cook, which I, always surprises me, and which is part of why I've written the book, too, to say, hey, look, anybody could do this. If I could do it, you could do it. You know, I was always brought up to be, you have to be productive. You have to be productive. So cooking became a way for me to feel like I was being productive 
and yet I was kind of able to space out. So, so what does it do for you, like personally, mentally, spiritually, when you cook? Because it, it's got to have some sort of connection, right? Emotional. It does. It's it's all of that. It's it's giving back. It's giving from your heart. It's it's sitting down with friends and family and exchanging beliefs, ideas, uh, and just warming up to one another. So it really combines all of that. Mm. You, you can't be in that room, in that kitchen, and have dinner with us without feeling that way. And writing this book, I mean, you wrote this during the pandemic. I did. And we weren't able to see family, friends, or anyone. And to sit down and sort of rehash those memories, those personal stories, that must have really been difficult for you at times because you're reliving those memories and you're not able to see your family and your parents pass. What was that like for you emotionally? It was very difficult. There, there, there's a couple of little, little excerpts in there that I know just really touched me and brought me to tears. And sometimes I'd call my sister and my cousin Linda, who I dedicated the book to, and I'd say, I'm tired of eating pasta. I never thought I'd say that. Could you make this dish and make <laughs> sure you follow the recipe? Because the truth is, Craig, we would just throw stuff in the pot and the pan. We didn't measure. We didn't. So when I had to decide how much oil I was putting in, it was it was a process. It was, mm -hmm. uh, I don't think I made it right this time. Let me do it again. So, you know, you want people to also put their heart and their mm -hmm. faith into it and just do what they feel about cooking. And what story sort of touches you the most? Son, walking from church with my sister and my cousin to my grandmother's house, when we would, every once in a while, we'd say, oh my God, we can smell the gravy out on the street. Wow. We could smell it because they all had these, you know, attached homes. They were multiple family buildings, you know, three or four, not huge buildings. And there would always be a, just a small opening in the window where you could actually peer in and see. And you'd always see the, the Italian mother or grandmother. Mm -hmm. you, did you ever see those big metal pots that they look like yeah, yeah. somebody went through the war with them? And they're stirring it and they have an apron on and the, the aroma would just, it would just permeate onto the street. And we'd walk there and every once in a while, if I'm cooking something and I get that, it really, you're bringing me to my, it really brings me back mm. to those days. Right. And I miss them very much. And they say that the olfactory sense, the sense of smell, is one of the strongest uh, senses to bring you into a memory. And interestingly, when I went to Italy for the first time and I got off the plane and I stepped out and I looked, I looked at the mountains and the hillside, I said, oh my God, this is who I am. Mm. This is the piece of me that I couldn't put together when I that I that wasn't quite there for me. And now I know this is this is from once I've come. This is who I am. My grandparents came here on a boat, both sides, nobody speaking English, reading or writing English, kids in tow, and came here. And that was the piece of me that was missing, knowing where I had come from. Wow. That's beautiful. Well, we're gonna take a quick break we're going to have Monsignor Jamie who's going to join us and we have a few sort of the do's the don'ts and some of the you know common mistakes and questions so we'll we'll be right back with Monsignor Jamie Gigantio. Hey guys welcome back we're sitting down with Monsignor Jamie and Judge Patricia Domango thank you so much for sitting down with me the holidays are coming you know and there's always these do's these don'ts these my wife said they're not do's and don'ts but the arguments that happen over the table and you spoke about a lot of them in your book so the first thing is we're going to go through this list what is stiza what is a stiza it was dialect my grandmother would say and when I would say what do you put in this she'd say Una panda de farina, una stizza de sala, a little bit of salt. Ah. Stizza. Sti right. And I used to say, you what's know, a stizza? Do we have a stizza? <laughs> do we own a stizza? The what do you do with it? dialects in Italian, you'll never know. Forget about it. Yeah, I was looking in the drawer. I'm like, I don't think I own a stizza, but all right. So is it sauce or gravy? What's the difference? Technically, anything that comes from meat or a bone is gravy. A sauce comes from ingredients that are mixed mm. together. That's the technical difference. I just take the view that sauce is the broad category, what mm. you're gonna put on your, any of your food, whether it's on your beef, on your chicken, on your turkey, on your macaroni, on your potato, it's sauce, sauce. But if you put meat in it, like the Monsignor mm -hmm. said, if you put meat in it or meat stock in some way, it actually turns the tomato sauce into 
a darker color and it becomes gravy. Mm -hmm. It's meat gravy. I don't know why people make fun of the Italians. That's not gravy. It's only with meat. No, there is meat in here and it is darker. Let me ask you now, do you add grated cheese to the meal or taste it first and then add it or no grated cheese at all? I drown my food in grated cheese. There's certain foods that you need grated cheese on. It's like having french fries without ketchup. Some people like a little bit more than others and they'll do it. I but, think you sprinkle with, when you're putting it in a serving bowl, you're going to sprinkle some on top. You're not going to overdo it because you just want to give it a moderate taste. But then you go around with the bowl and you say, anybody want more cheese? And you'll always see me go, yeah, just keep putting it on. And was in Italy, you said in, or somewhere you went when you asked for it? Uh, they, Yes, when I was in, it, it in Puglia, when I was in Italy, I ordered a, a, a fish sauce, like a pasta with pescatore or something. With fish, and I said, could I get cheese? They said, no. I said, I thought they were kidding. I said, but I'd like <laughs> no it. No, we won't bring fish. it. We won't bring it. Wow. All right, so how about this? Pasta or macaroni, what's the difference? Pasta is fresh, usually. And macaroni is, I, I don't know, is it Neapolitan? Uh, pasta covers all, all the different forms of pasta. Macaroni was one form, mm -hmm. you know, all the different shapes and sizes, mm -hmm. they have different names to them. One of the shapes was macaroni. So when it came here right away, you know, people, you started to use the term macaroni as a broad sense. I love lasagna and you mentioned in the book too. Do you buy it? Do you only eat it out or do you buy the box? All three. Lasagna. You buy the box lasagna? I buy yeah. box. I buy fresh pasta really? sheets. What is it Stofa stuff? Is that oh, no, the... that's what you mean by box? You... No. Yeah. No, yeah. no, 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 like no. Like eating ragu. No. Oh. Actually, I don't eat Yeah, it. right. <laughs> this is an easy one. Sundays, do you eat dinner at 2 or 5 or 6 p.m.? Oh, that's very easy. 2 o'clock. 2 o'clock. 2 o'clock. Sunday was an afternoon dinner. It was, it was very reminiscent of being in Italy. I mean, what, I think what they did on Sunday between going to church, coming home, meeting family, and having extended family at the table, I think was very much reminiscent of what they did in, in back in, in Italy. And so in, if you go to Europe, they eat their big meal mm -hmm. in the middle Every of the day. day. Every day. They right. Eat. But we did it on Sundays. Right. It was because everybody was home. Your, your grandparents weren't working and parents weren't working. And you, right. could, you could eat at 2 o'clock in the afternoon just like they did in the old country. And okay. supper was something light. That's why exactly, on Sunday yeah. you would have dinner at four, two o'clock. You'd be done at four. In Italy, they had supper at night. So Sunday night, we go get the macaroni out, and heat you it reheat up, it. You know, make a meatball sandwich. Exactly. Or something like yeah. That. Uh, and how often do you stir the sauce? Oh, you, you can never stir yeah. sauce too much. You just stir it every time you walk past the pot. Basically, yeah. you go look at it. You give it a stir, and then you taste a little bit. Did you use fresh tomatoes or canned? We always use canned. We used to can, but my grandmother at the end of the summer would would jar her own tomato sauce. So if you went, they would get bushels, you know, because you can use them bruised the tomatoes, and they you would go and they would have all the jars with this, you know, the vacuum seal tops and all, and they'd be in the pot. But we, what are you doing? We'd ask, what are you doing? You know, grandma's making her own sauce, and they would jar it, and then you, they'd use it throughout the year. But but we, wow. as growing up, my, you know, my mother was buying the sauce unless we got it from grandma. What about the wine? Did you get the wine from Dominic, or did you? Uncle Dominic, my well, uncle Dominic was on my father's side, my grandma. So on both sides, they made wine in the basement, and they would go down there, and they'd had the barrels, and the rooms were dark and cold. What was the room called? Uh, we but, called it my mother, my whatever, my grandmother-in-law, grandmother, Gandine. Gandine, no, right? Oh, yeah, the I called the Gandolini. Gandine. <laughs> Families in general, right? They don't really sit down for dinner. But from what I noticed during the pandemic, for me too, I was home all the time. Sat down with my son and my wife and we enjoyed family dinner and that's sort of lost in society. And, and I think people did get that sort of realization of how important it is. And you know, you talk about the good old days of black and white memories and when you were younger and it was the good old days. Do you think that the way it is now, do you think we'll ever go back to the days with Grandma Josephine or Uncle Dominic and sitting down as a family and just being present? I don't think we'll go back completely, but I think the pandemic helped us to put our priorities in order. We were forced to be together with immediate family, not having, you know, 100 people there and, you know, being busy all every day, but the importance of sitting down every day with family and eating and sharing, um, it made us think. So I think people will be more, um, you know, in tune to do that a little bit more. But I don't think we'll ever go back 
to what it was then. We can't because our lives are just structured differently mm. these days. We, we don't live next to one another anymore. I mean, I don't think I can name three relatives that live within walking distance. I can't name one relative right. that walk, lives within walking distance of my home. So we, we don't have, it's not that easy and convenient for us in that way. But what, what like Monsignor is saying, but COVID was a reminder mm -hmm. of how important this was. And I think we've now made an effort through, the, through different means through Zoom calls, through through other means to try to now connect again to one another in a way that we, I mean, I had Easter dinner during COVID online. I was alone in my home. I set up my table just for myself mm -hmm. and my sister was home. My niece was at her house. The in-laws were, and we had Easter dinner. And it was amazing. just, you know, it was amazing. Where can people find your book or connect with you? The On Hot Bench, which you're on TV every day. On seniors on once in a while, but where can people connect with you? Well, we do have a, a Facebook and an, uh, and all of these internet means of connecting with one another. Uh, the book can be purchased either through Amazon or through uh, Barnes and Noble websites. Honestly, fantastic book. There Thank are a you. couple of recipes in there. I'm going to and try one of them out. isn't one of my recipes in there. No, that was edited. See, everybody out. wants credit for the spaghetti credit for the and linguine and clams. Isn't that no. my recipe? No. That's oh, my recipe. But you, you went clammy. <laughs> he went clam. He was one of the people in the group that went clammy when we got all these yes. clams from the Shinnecock Bay. Well, guys, listen, it's been a pleasure. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Judge Domango. Thank, thank you, you for Monsignor having Jamie. me. And thank you for all that you do. I appreciate really, that. Really, this is amazing. It's amazing what you do. Oh, thank you. Well, it's because of Monsignor Jamie, because of God, because of you know my foundation that I'm able to do this. So I appreciate that very much. Guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode of Walk in Faith. Always remember, you have the ability to inspire and evangelize through your words and actions. God bless you.